Hello, I guess Falchik at three shasket in program my ek BBC Alba. I had all good crea sell sports and ban. As Michelle Bantain, I guess I'm a tolly chirac about showing click at their Glasgow City. I guess Alba, Suzanne Lappin, a rash call rooms in studio. Our program the Heike Noch, quite a shinrash, a shakin, vor ele, a son skippin and ban, a galaba, see at the fearkin came ele gal, a young sea cook in the crinia. Fishing Sularish could crush here in Och Cooper League in SWPL at her Glasgow City, I guess Celtic. I guess be Isla Short the Gaishin, Muslia, Vovina Kyolather, good shake and yawing a shower and a rohrock finia. Achin Toshoch, Fashing Hot Dulich Clenchen and Shachkin Shaw, Minavas, Eka Clicketer, Rugby, Ock, Talentoch, Alabanoch, Siobhan Katagin. Here is Rugby in the Halaba and a fist Nayoch. The thoughts of all our people and players go out to Siobhan's family and many teammates at Stirling County and Scotland at this incredibly difficult time. Siobhan Catigan won 19 caps for Scotland between 2018 and 2021. But Siobhan was a great player in the squad of rugby in the Halibut and was a great player in the Halibut and was a great player in the Halibut. She was a great player in the Halibut and she was a great player I guess the Karachin ex Siobhan. And how many Shula Horsher Ash, Grun Lichen, Kutramach, or son skip in the Halibut, see at the Fierchein Rukumel or Kursa, or son Kuchp in the Krinje. Femi Piti in a cafe, and just had nothing to find it. It's hard to get a little hazard. But she did see it. Boxana Kraftchuk in the UK, and she did hazard. I guess who had it? I should Paul Sheen play once from the VI. I guess I put in the Gen V to find it. The look up. Okay, McCourt to the issue and a shower and a show for the We're up a kid in Parakank and Wood, which is Shinner to the Villa Commissar. Which means you could do a Bondarchuk lab in the Shin. Or Mikey Ukran. And I must again. Going on the ball with Tarsten McGivick. Oh, Savile of Ali Alexander. I'm born to do it at the Tool. Half took a year to run the state. Chances of Ufkus. Corum Shark, Gabby Harrison. Harrison, oh, for a tashing. Oh, but Corum Owens for Corum, go up and go with Hosha. Oh, my, Paul, my, Ferris. So Ferris to go, get his bag. Gary Rash, oh, Sally Skinner, Lily Alexander. Oh, Apurto. Rish, Varro Erist. The Caldente, he intervened the path. Ah, Apurto. Yeah, he Apurto, the Huri, Shepherd, Lily Alexander.
Pucci showed Spanchi Luke Oh Howard Cut him shot tall Oh Merak the Alapa Duck with his Howard Gakalak Gaheen Fakalak got him with the Spanchi Gas Lucas I guess Andresto Cold Minich and Gowan A Dirigi Hierke Andresto Mosso Semien Howard the Bound of the Falava Savalin that Me Alexander Christy Murray, who had a cast finish in. Oh, no, tell me. Oh, tell me. Oh, tell me. Oh, shit. But how for Salah to grab it? It's a huge shit. Bonmati, Bonmati has, Bonmati little, oh, Basar Hill could be on, Alexander in the start, get out, that who is, Bonmati reached, Bonmati, Jenny Kane has, and who is it, I guess it's fine, Paul Gignoni and Hosho. Cut him short, tell the lip. Hope Eris, Ro Eris. I guess she'd be, but she fallen down in the raid. I let all the new way, the home of it in you. Alexia Pateas, Spain, you think this action, pull up a push up a Ralafu. She's tough it. She will hit the Barcelona to chill it. Your cast, Alexander Vich, keep it where he cast finish it. Even it's Jig, Rigo, Shachta, Yiddish, the Hietel, the name, a Jenny and Bosso. Oh, the book of the Tel Milach is in, very passionate. Got a Milach, he has the show, the hook of Shachta, the Hound, oh, I stay. Suzanne, welcome back to 360. Thank you. I was hoping to have you back on the sofa. We'd have a bit more positive talk in terms of Scotland, but actually seeing that there, how would you sum up the double header Friday night and Tuesday night? Yeah, I think overall it's you know it's disappointing. I think the girls will be going away from the camp, you know, disappointed not to have you know taken more. Um, I think the aim going into it would have at least to have you know got three points against Ukraine on on Friday night. Um, you know, I think there's a lot, you know, to learn collectively as a team, also individually as well. People need to, you know, look at their own performances. Also, the, the manager maybe needs to reflect on some of the tactics and the, the setup. Um, you know, Friday night, I don't think it quite worked. Um, and then obviously on the Tuesday night as well, um, you know, to lose by such a, a heavy goal margin um, is, is difficult to take. And, you know, the girls will need to, you know, regroup and regroup quickly um, for the games coming up next year. Over the two games, Suzanne, nine goals conceded, one goal scored. If we take a positive in, in all of this, we did score one. Abby Harrison, that last minute equaliser against Ukraine on a Friday night. Was it good to see her back in the squad and actually good to get that goal? Yeah, I was really pleased to see her in the squad and then to you know start the game on Friday night. I think, you know, Abby's a, a striker that brings, you know, something a bit different, um, a, a physical presence. You know, she harries defenders into making mistakes. Um, we seen that on Friday night before she even got her goal. She made, 
you know, two chances out of nothing for herself and probably should have done better with, you know, one of them. But, you know, she persevered. She kept working hard all night and, you know, in the end managed to, to get her head on it and get that equaliser, which, you know, could prove crucial in the, in the long run. And she was so close to scoring against Spain in the kind of opening five minutes. Yeah, she was. And again, you know, that was good pressure overall from the team. But, you know, Abby just doing what she does and being around the box and, you know, pouncing on any loose ball. And, you know, it's, it's great with hindsight to say, you know, maybe I should have dinked it over the keeper or whatever else. But, you know, she's connected with the ball really well. And it's, you know, unfortunately come off the, the crossbar. In terms of Ukraine on Friday night, a draw, when you look back at it now, was that good enough? I don't think it was, you know, as I say, I think the mindset going into the camp would have been to take the three points, you know, a home fixture with the crowd behind you, you know, Scotland are more than capable of, of beating Ukraine, um, you know, they dominated possession, you know, for the majority of the game, um, you know, it just, it didn't seem to come off whatever the, you know, the tactics was, um, you know, I think Erin touched on it in her post-match interview that, you know, it, it didn't quite work what they had planned and, and that was evident, you know, that, it just seemed to be, you know, one way traffic and, and the one route that, that Scotland were going and it wasn't quite working for them. Um, you know, they weren't really getting the ball into areas that could really hurt Ukraine. Um, and I think from that point of view, they'll be really disappointed that, that they didn't capitalise and, and take the three points. And you'd be hoping after that that Scotland would regroup and maybe have something against Spain. We always knew that was going to be a really tough match, one of the best teams in the world. But when you see the scoreline, when you watch the goals that Scotland conceded, how do you even sum up that result? Yeah, I mean, we can't get away from the fact that, you know, Spain are a world-class team, you know, and, and I think everyone expected Scotland to lose the match, you know, and that's not being negative, but that's just a reality probably of the, the difference in, and where the teams are at. Um, but I think, you know, Scotland started really well, you know, nearly got to the 20 minute mark without having conceded and actually, you know, pressing well and pressing at the right times. And then, you know, just after that first goal went in. Um, the floodgates opened. Yeah, the, the floodgates <laughs> opened. And, you know, and I think that's why it's really important that, you know, players individually look at their own performance, you know, collectively and, and the managers as well in terms of the, the setup, because, you know, a lot of those goals came from basic errors, which, you know, you get away with in other games, but you don't get away with, you know, against quality opposition like Spain. And, you know, at least three or four of those goals, you know, was individual basic mistakes where, you know, could just have made better decision making in, in instances in the game. But, you know, as, as I say, it's easy to sit here, you know, on a sofa and, and talk about it and, you know, make these sort of comments, you know, it, it is difficult playing against top class opposition who are on a phenomenal run, run of goal scoring and not conceding. Um, so, you know, they, they need to take the positives that they can take, but they also need to, you know, reflect and, you know, they'll know themselves that it's not good enough to lose 8-0, it, it just isn't, you know, and, and they'll be hoping when the return fixture comes at Hamden, you know, it's a more respectable scoreline. But you know, you know what it's like to play for Scotland. You know what it's like to play for top teams in Scotland who, when you do play these big kind of European teams, you, you can concede. But 8-0 is not a scoreline that this Scotland team are used to. Yeah. And that you wouldn't expect either. No, they're not. Um, and particularly, you know, the success they've had over the last couple of years in the, you know, the World Cup in particular, you know, I think no one associates an 8-0 loss with the Scotland women's team now, you know, and particularly, you know, the attention and focus that they now get in Scotland off the back of the success of the World Cup, you know, they will come in for criticism, you know, with this goal line and that might be something that, you know, some of the girls aren't used to and, you know, they'll need to get used to that level of focus um, on them now, but... Yeah, you know, it's not good for any professional footballer, you know, an 8 0 score line is, is never good. Um, but, you know, Pedro's going to need to somehow, you know, dust the team off and, and get the morale back up for, you know, some crucial games at the start of next year. I was just going to ask, how do you get the morale back up? I mean, you're, you're, especially when they were playing in it on Tuesday night, things did just go from bad to worse. We knew that. But actually, especially in the, the hours and the days after and the months now, what do they need to do to kind of regroup? I think they almost need to, you know, 
they, they need to get somehow find a settled sort of team. Um, you know, that is one of the things for me, like the back four changed. I know perhaps, you know, Jen Beattie was forced through injury, but, you know, having a, a settled goalkeeper and a solid back four is, you know, is foundation to any successful team. And I know, you know, it's different from a national team and a club level, you know, there will be changes, but, you know, I think for me, some of the changes going into the Spain game were maybe the opposite of what I would have thought. You know, the two fullbacks that played um, against Spain are more attack minded, um, you know, which for me was a bit strange. Um, but I think Pedro's, you know, he's got to, you know, he's still early in his Scotland managerial career. You know, leaders like Jen Beatty, like Rachel Corsi, you know, like Erin Cuthbert have got to somehow get the team together, you know, focus on the positives. You know, one positive is they've got a phenomenal goalkeeper who, you know, on Tuesday night made some phenomenal saves again to, you know, keep it at eight now. Um, you know, they've got quality players in, in Caroline Weir and Erin Cuthbert. And, you know, I think Pedro just needs to try and work a way to get the best out of these players. That's the thing, because not all hope is lost. Um, they are still second in the group, three more games to play. How do they even go into, well, what have we got, about four, four or five months now until their next qualifier? So what, what happens in this time? Yeah, I think it's important, you know, they'll obviously be back at their clubs, they'll have some time off, you know, for Christmas, etc. But I think, you know, when they come back and they come back to the camp, you know, if they qualify through the playoffs, you know, nobody's going to sit, you know, in six months, seven months time and go, oh, remember that score line against Spain, you know, they do need to learn from it. It's, it's important they analyse, you know, and critique themselves, but it's also important that they, they move on from it, you know, they focus on, you know, how do they go and, and get three points against Ukraine away from home, you know, when Spain come to Hamden, you know, use the crowd, use the atmosphere to, you know, make it a respectable scoreline, do their best to, you know, give, make it hard for Spain, you know, it almost became too easy for Spain in the end on Tuesday night. And then obviously the, the Pharaohs, the last game where, you know, hopefully they can, you know, finish on a high, but, you know, as you say, still all to play for. Um, so fingers crossed they can, they can do it. And hopefully next year we'll be talking a bit more positively <laughs> and hopefully not so many goals conceded. But yeah, yeah, fingers crossed. We can garage, hi three shasket the gopper fell, can you hug the isle of short? Ye should go in with a duel and a hair of the echke, find you art ere and a rock rock benye. Le dochus yn ag ail o siort y dochach mae'r niach cywlog. Yn ŵr sgwt wedi blasad y rôr o'ch fynio, rhywun i chi y sbors y ianw lan ŵnio. I went straight from like being a full-time child musician to racing every weekend on the national scene and just meeting loads of new people. I've developed like loads of really nice friendships through that, which just kept it really fun at that age. And I just, yeah, went straight in and raced like all summer long. When I was 16, 17, I very quickly started winning races and went to compete at an international level. And I never really had the progression to the front of those bike races. I was just suddenly there. And that definitely gave me this kind of naive perspective on, on mountain biking that I just continued to be at the top all the way through my career. And that was something I've definitely have a different understanding of now. <laughs> When I was a junior and I was kind of starting to, I guess, show the world what I thought I could do, um, I was hit by a car when I was out training. This was 2013 and physically I was kind of fine after a couple of months. I had a fractured collarbone and uh, two compression fractures in my spine. And although quite serious injuries, because I, I was young, I recovered very quickly. But the psychological effects that had on me were a lot longer lasting. Um, kind of like struggling to get back on the bike and pushing myself technically, because mountain biking is an extreme sport and injuries are part of it. But kind of find the, trying to find the confidence to do that again in a really crucial part of my progression as a bike rider was, yeah, really difficult and something that I've found I'm kind of playing catch up on a little bit now 
Um, and then obviously just the psychological impact of realizing at 16 that you're not invincible um, is quite, uh, makes you think about what you want in life. And fortunately for me, it made me think, I definitely want to do this <laughs> despite the, you know, the potential consequences with the injuries and stuff. So in some ways it was actually a really positive thing that happened to me. No, I I am very much in love with the sport now and always will be. But I think um I was really lucky to have a really positive kind of happy environment around me with the team that I was on at the time and everyone was really understanding and people didn't really put pressure on me and bike race, racing at that age was you know it was you're an under 23 rider in the grand scheme of things it's not that important and that was like a nice place for me to be in whilst I tried to find the love again for racing and I went through a period of just getting like career bests every race because I was on that kind of comeback trajectory and for me that just like re-sparked the love for it because I love winning and that's what I was I was doing I was back on my pathway to the top and that was when I kind of reconfirmed that that's what I wanted to do. Khata could do later in a pandemic started Isla August for Joe Hayes and I had a bicycle get the Kylie Mach in the Gemichen Olympic on the Davilus ticket hi on the Joe or to it Hoshok it Paris Davilus care had it it's just it's been a really frustrating time because obviously athletes don't have a lifelong career and losing a year or a year and a half of that has felt a bit stressful at times but actually somehow during covid during 2020 we had like a really intense short season at the end of the year and i managed to get some results that were kind of i thought a few years away and that really gave me a lot of confidence going forward and then i found lockdown 2 in the uk a big struggle psychologically and my 2021 season was it was good but it wasn't fireworks and um I was also shortlisted for Tokyo and I never went but the plan was never to go the plan was to kind of be in the mix and for me that's made me really excited for Paris because for the first time I watched the Olympic race seeing like my friends race rather than these you know big superstars and that was really nice because it just you know I'm one of them and that's my plan is to be on that start line in a few years and alongside that I've uh, I've now finished in the top 15 at World Cup six times so I'm getting a bit bored of that <laughs> and I would like to get a top 10 next year and just kind of try my best to continue my path to hopefully winning a World Cup at some point and you know just trying to continue to learn about how I'm going to get there because you're always learning and every year you look back and you think what was I doing <laughs> so yeah I'm pretty excited about everything I've learned through Covid and with my racing along with that so yeah. Ha Isla na tachrichia is on slán jínjín gu harich on the spores as hea crechin gavil lúkleisach a ha tolichia a gianún a seáad. Ha hea son seo a hiltin to lúkleisach an ila an to hula spores agus hea tors imirag idin bui a haik na mian in socialta social media is such a big part of our jobs and you know there are people judging all of our performances and creating narratives around that and I always thought you know if if I can let my audience have that context and understand what's going on with me to an extent then I don't feel that pressure to perform if you know I'm not capable on that day and it's it's just made racing a lot easier because you know I don't have to hide away if I have a bad day I can just say having a bad time and that's I think really nice and I know a lot of people can't um, struggle to kind of be open about that and articulate that and I I'm a big definitely a big advocate for happiness comes first and more and more I'm understanding that you know nothing nothing is relevant if you can't help yourself and especially during Covid I've learned that you know for me to do good for other people and for me to race my bike and inspire people through that I need to be happy so at some point the thing that you love and want to pursue it becomes a job and I think making sure no matter what level you're at it's always finding the time to reconnect with the the reason why you got into it as a kid because I, 
I don't know about most people, but I didn't start riding a bike because I wanted to be Olympic champion one day. I just like being outside. And I'm quite lucky because I love bike riding separate from racing and training. And for me, that means if I need time away from my job, I'll probably go on a big bike ride, <laughs> which I think is a, is a really nice kind of relationship to have with it. But I think everyone can have that relationship with their sport, even if it's their job. I think it's just making sure you turn all your data off and just go out and enjoy what you got into it. Suzanne, what an honest and positive athlete Isla is. There, there's so much that we can take from there that we can relate to so many different sports, sports, especially we were just talking with the football. But I mean, if we just look first, a huge one with her back injury, how do you come back from that? I mean, it's, it's actually really amazing to see. Yeah, no, it is. Um, she obviously touched on, like, you know, the physical aspect of coming back, but also the psychological, which for her was, you know, a lot tougher. And, you know, I think you can relate to that because, you know, as she said, she was young and, you know, you heal physically, you heal quickly. But, you know, to have the bravery to get back on the bike again and, you know, to compete at the level that she is again is, you know, huge credit to her. And in terms of mental resilience in sport, I mean, Isla was talking about it. It's probably interesting to talk about it in terms of the Scotland squad too, because you need that. And I mean, we especially see it again, like I was saying with social media. Yeah. For the Scotland squad coming out of Tuesday night's defeat, how, how do you deal with that? Do you, do you stay away from it? Do you take it on board? Because it's very different now. There's so much on social media. You really can't get away from a bad performance. Yeah, no, you can't. Um, I think, you know, nowadays in any top level sport, you need resilience, you know, and I think as an athlete, you know, naturally you become resilient, you know, even that you then take into your personal life, you know, I think being part of a sport, no matter what it is, whether it's individually or collectively, you know, resilience is something that you naturally grow to have. But, you know, with the social media thing, you know, we've touched on it, it's, you know, it's great, the attention, you know, particularly the women's football was getting and all the positive, you know, things that that can bring. But there's also, you know, that tougher side when, you know, things don't go your way and, you know, it can be hard to read criticism and, and deal with criticism. And I think, you know, it is something that, you know, nowadays, you know, perhaps we need to do more to support players on, you know, because sometimes they're forced into the decision where they have to, you know, maybe take themselves off social media, if, you know, just to take themselves away from it. But... You know, I think as an athlete, you know, resilience is very important to have. And, you know, she, she touched on it well, you know, particularly to come back from, from what she came back from and, you know, to be aiming for what she is now is, you know, is phenomenal. Well, that's thanks on the other side of it. I was talking about being open and honest on social media and people understanding that there's a lot going on. I mean, in terms of the Scotland performance, we look at it, we look at the... The highlights, we look at the goals they conceded, what's going... I mean, what happened over the double header, but actually... When you look at the bigger picture, mentally and psychologically, away from the pitch, anything could have been going on. Yeah, yeah, and you never know that. You know, you know. I think as a spectator or a fan or whatever, you know, watching from afar, you never truly know, you know, what's going on. Um, you know, away from the the football pitch, and you know, it's it's difficult. You know, as a, a top athlete, unfortunately, sometimes you need to deal with those sort of pressures and. You know, you've, you could have, you know, numerous things going on in your personal life, but when you go on that pitch, you're expected to perform at 100 percent. And, you know, we're all human beings. So, you know, naturally, that's just not always, always possible. Um, but I think it's, you know, I think it's important, as I say, that, you know, players these days, it's, it's great to have the strength and conditioning and the nutrition and, you know, all of those benefits. But I think, you know, the how to handle the, the pressure of social media and, and, you know, the increased focus that's that's now on athletes, particularly the, the dramatic change for, for women's sport, because let's be honest, you know, 10 years ago when I played, it, it wasn't the same intensity that it is now, you know, in terms of focus. So I think that needs to be factored in as, as the game continues to grow. Well, really interesting conversation and really glad that Isla brought it up and I really hope that Paris 24, that she, she does make and, and do well there. But, I mean, if we stick with football, we do have the uh, League Cup final coming up, Glasgow City versus Celtic. You will be there for BBC yeah. Alba. How do you think things are going to go? 
Firstly, I think it's great, you know, the, the cup finals are back because they are, you know, they're, they're great competitions, you know, teams perform differently in cups as they do in the league, you know, for whatever reason, it just seems to be the case. And, you know, it's a, it's a one-off game. Um, you know, I think if we look at, you know, how Celtic and, and Glasgow City have, have done this season, you know, they, the game they, they drew against each other to all, you know, so it, it will be a tough match. Um, you know, obviously Eileen in her, you know, first cup final as a Glasgow City manager, you know, there is expectation to, to win cups as a, as a Glasgow City manager. And then Fran, on the other hand, you know, it's been a long time since Celtic lifted silverware. Um, so pressure on him from, from that angle as well. Does that two-all draw between the sides make it, a l does it make it a little bit harder, given that there wasn't a winner last time out? So they're kind of going into this fresh, not really knowing what way it could go. Yeah, I think it, you know, it has changed in recent years. You know, obviously Glasgow City have dominated the league for so long and you know, the, they have had the upper hand over Celtic for numerous years. But I think, you know, slowly but surely Celtic have been getting closer and closer to them and you know the draw proves that so you know I think this Celtic team will be going into it with a lot more confidence that you know it is a one-off game anything can happen on the day and you know I think they'll fully believe that you know it's probably their best chance in a long time to to win silverware. I was just actually going to ask you do you think this could be their chance of silverware this season? I think so. Um, you know, obviously Rangers have started really strongly in the league and, you know, I've said numerous times, you know, there is huge pressure on Rangers to win that league now, given, you know, how they performed last season. You know, Glasgow City never go away and, you know, they never will go away. Um, but I think Celtic, you know, will be looking at this as, you know, Glasgow City missing a few key players as well. You know, it's, it's a huge opportunity for them. Missing a few key players, but we know what they're like, and especially under pressure too. Yeah, um, Glasgow City, you know, having been part of it for numerous years, you know, they, they enjoy being written off, you know, and that is what they thrive on. You know, they've just got this togetherness and will to win that's, that's like no other club. And, you know, I, I'm not certainly not going to write them off, you know, in this cup final. You know, I think they'll be determined to make sure that, you know, they're still the team that's picking up the trophies in Scotland. Um, but I do think it will be, you know, it'll be a quite a tight match on the on the day. Who do you think will win? Could you I'm give that score? I'm, I'm never going to sit here and say Glasgow City <laughs> won't win. I just I just can't do it. Um, you know, so for me, you know, I think, you know, they do know how to win um, under pressure. And you know, even if the game isn't going their way, you know, they they dig in right to the very end. So, so for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Glasgow City. Do you think a high scoreline? No, I don't think so. I think it'll be a tough game. You know, I do think, you know, it could be a close, you know, evenly balanced game, but I think Glasgow City will, will just maybe have enough on the day. Brilliant. Well, a great one to look forward to, yep. especially you enjoy it. But thank <laughs> you very much for joining us this no week, Suzanne. Well, Shanair Son and Nock, and a Yach game, we leave McConnell Colour Rooms in studio. Jen Keen, Shokavel, Shiva Length and BBC Alba, or YouTube, or Son of Hula Sheen, Kokiangle Cherry 3, Sheskit Ayn. I guess kind of can get again Bjo at their Glasgow City, I guess Celtic, or BBC Alba, Jadonic, or Sun Cooper League in SWPL. Kishin Shevinach Yachkin.